you're good to go, Lisa. Uh, sure. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we would like to welcome Mutu here with us today. Mutu is a professor at the um, uh, University of Rochester, and um, I guess we'll be starting in fall in the Georgetown University. And Mutu will present his work, Is It Easier to Prove Theorems That Are Guaranteed to Be True? Mutu, we are um, very happy that uh, you took the time to be here with us today, and we are very excited to hear your talk. Uh, thanks, Lisa, and thanks, uh, Ke as well. Uh, and thanks, Elaine, too, for uh, inviting me to, uh, to give this talk. Um, let me just uh, start the timer just so that. Uh, so can I understand that this is like a one hour talk, like, and I can take like around 50, 55 minutes. Is that, is that good? Is that the usual uh, time frame? Yeah, that sounds good. OK, awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk about this work uh, that appeared in, I think, Fox last year. Uh, this is joint work with Rafa. Uh, is it easier to prove theorems that are guaranteed to be true? So this work is sort of in, in the middle of like cryptography and, uh, and, and complexity uh, theory. It's going to sound a little more complexity-ish, but you'll see that the techniques that we're going to use uh, are going to be from, uh, from crypto. OK, so. Um, Arguably, P versus NP is probably the biggest open question, you know, that we know of in uh, in computer science. But probably this is not the most important question, because even if P is not equal to NP, that is, you know, in the worst case, it doesn't mean that it's hard in practice. It could be the case that you know the the kind of problems that we encounter are easy to solve, and you know, uh, maybe with high probability we could solve them. Uh, if the instances came from all efficiently sampleable distributions. And it could be the case that what we encounter, the kind of problems we encounter in the real world are these kind of distributions, are the ones that are efficiently sampleable. So towards understanding, you know, this complexity of these hard problems, I mean, Gurbich in 89 and Impagla in 95 tried to capture this in terms of a gate. So here there is, uh, you know, in this uh, uh, slide, I have two pictures. This is more inspired by Impagliazzo when he, you know, introduced the Impagliazzo worlds. So on the left, you have Frederick Goss and uh, on the right is his um, like elementary school math professor, Graus. And he was kind of uh, annoyed that Goss was solving all the questions that he, uh, you know, he gave him. So inspired by that, Impagliazzo envisioned a world where uh, Graus, picks you know, some language in NP, picks an instance and gives according to some distribution D and gives it to Gauss. And Gauss needs to either say uh, whether you know, X is in the language or not. And if it is in the language, produce a witness. Okay. Now, the success probability of Gauss with respect to this distribution D kind of captures the average case complexity of this language F. And this is kind of what we want to understand over here, because we're saying, look, even if P is not equal to NP in the worst case, we want to understand what is the hardness of NP on the average. And this game kind of captures that. However, one thing in this game that is kind of unsatisfactory is that the case when X is not in L, if Gauss says that X is not in L, Professor Grouse might not be able to verify that efficiently. Okay, so you know, uh, Gross gives X, and you know, Gauss says X is not an L. Gross can't probably there could be the case that it, he might not be able to verify this efficiently because in the other case he will be. If you give me a witness, I can check. But if it's not an L, you cannot. Uh, you might not be able to verify it efficiently. So the main question that we want to ask in this in this work is. Would this, like this game or this uh, average case complexity become any easier if we forced the statement sampled by Professor Grouse to be promised to be true, okay? Because in this case, you can always efficiently verify whether Gauss is telling the right answer or not, okay? So this, this diagram over here kind of captures average case complexity, but we are asking, does the you know, game become any easier if I am assured, if I'm promised that these statements are guaranteed to be true? And I mean, this has been, you know, uh, understanding the, 
complexity of a language under these promised true uh, condition, I mean, is not new. I mean, uh, Ivan Jacobi and even Salman Jacobi in the 80s already you know, proposed this. And that's when they, in fact, introduced the notion of a promise problem in, in complexity theory. And they were, of course, motivated by cryptography. So in public key encryption, you want security to hold only for valid ciphertext. Right? It is only for a restricted space that you need the security to hold, not for everything. And this motivated them to introduce promise problems. So the main open problem that we want to ask over here is, does average case hardness of NP imply average case hardness of NP when the instances are promised to be true? Okay. Now, we talk about NP search because you know if they're promised to be true, it's not a yes, no game. It's not a decision game. It is a search game, right? If it's promised to be true, the only hard thing over there is to produce a witness. So the question we are asking is, uh, if NP is hard on the average, is it still hard on the average if I restrict to search problems where the distribution samples instances that are promised to be true? Okay, so this is the question we ask and we, we prove actually in this work that this is true. Okay, so just going back to the gross Gauss game, it doesn't become any easier. Okay, so, you know, because hard on the average NP implies that even for this restricted case of promise true NP search, it is hard on the average. Okay, so let me, uh, I mean, I'm going to go over some basic definitions of uh, average case complexity. and. It is essentially the you know the the foundations laid by Knuth and Levin in the seventies and eighties, but we're going to uh, give a slight variant which is essentially equivalent to how they defined what hard on the average means. Okay, so for a language in NP, the decision version of hard on the average says that a language is hard on the average to decide if there exists a probabilistic polynomial time sampler D such that no probabilistic polynomial time attacker A can decide the language with probability better than two thirds, okay? The search version of uh, hard on the average, again, requires a PPT sampler D and requires that an attacker not be able to find witnesses with probability better than one third. However, it has an additional condition where D samples instances in the language with significant probability. In fact, this probability must be bigger than this probability because otherwise the problem becomes trivial. If D only samples no instances, then it's trivially like, I mean, it's an easy problem because all that the attacker has to say is there is no witness. So you need some kind of guarantee on the distribution that it produces yes instances. And on those yes instances, the attacker cannot find witnesses with probability better than one third. The third kind that we are talking about here is the promise true kind, where it's essentially NP search, except that now the distribution needs to output instances in the language with probability one, always. Okay. So let's uh, discuss a little bit more. Uh, let's understand this class of promise true NP search problems. And we're going to uh, identify two natural subclasses of this uh, of this uh, of this class. Okay, so the first subclass um, I'm going to we're going to restrict NP problems to where every instance is guaranteed to have a witness. Okay, for all x uh, x's in the language, and this in fact is a well-studied class. It's referred to as total function NP or TFNP. And this was introduced by Megiddo and Papadimitrio in, uh, in 89. And I'll tell a little more about this class TFNP in a bit. The second class, which we are more familiar from cryptography, is not to restrict the instances themselves, like where they come from, but to say that the distribution can efficiently sample instances with a witness. Okay, now it's automatically guaranteed to be true because you know the distribution itself produces the witness uh, for uh, for the instance. And uh, in fact, again, I'll show this a little later. This restriction is equivalent to our one-way functions. Okay, so uh, this is a second natural subclass of promise true NP search that uh, uh, we are going to consider. Okay, so. Um, 
let's talk a little bit more about these two classes because look, we, are to, we want to understand the complexity of promise true NP search. We want to understand hard, like average case complexity of this class. We have identified two natural subclasses. I want to tell a little bit more about these two subclasses. So TFNP introduced by Megiddo and Papa Dimitriou. Um, they're search problems where every instance has a witness and alternative formulation is a search problem in NP coNP. Okay, what we know about this class is that in fact, we know that existence of many cryptographic primitives implies average case hardness of TFNP. I mean, it's been shown that, you know, assuming the existence of collision resistant hash functions or one-way permutations, we know that TFNP is hard on the average. However, we don't know if, uh, and this is going to be important, we don't know if existence of one-way functions imply uh, average case hardness of uh, TFNP. And TFNP in fact contains many interesting subclasses. Uh, which has also been like a, you know uh, uh, a popular area of research in the in the last uh, few years in complexity theory. So let me tell you a little bit more. Machine learning or local search is one subclass. So here you can think of an instance given by a graph where you have a starting point that the init gives, a neighbor function that produces neighbors of a, a particular point, and a cost function associated with every uh, with every node. And the goal is to find a local minimum, uh, a particular X that has the smallest cost with respect to all of its neighbors. Now, we know that any such instance will always have a solution, right? Because every you know, uh, directed acyclic graph or DAG has a sink. Okay, so here is an instance of an NP problem that always has a solution that's in TFNP. A second class, I mean, is Nash equilibrium. Every finite game has a Nash equilibrium, but can we efficiently find it? Well, you know, this, uh, this problem precisely defines this class PPAD. It's in fact complete for this class uh, of subclass of TFNP referred to as PPAD, again, introduced by Papa Dimitrio in, in 94. And there's been a lot of recent work on showing hardness of this class like average case hardness of this class under cryptographic assumptions. It started off with, some, with a beautiful work that showed uh, assuming indistinguishability obfuscation, but now this assumption has been improved quite a bit. So the first problem, again, related to the motivating open problem that we, uh, uh, we discussed before is, can I prove like a stronger thing? Average case hardness of NP, does it imply average case hardness of the subclass of this promise true NP search TFNP. So um, does NP uh, hard on the average imply that TFNP is hard on the average? Now, this open problem in fact has been, you know, there have been uh, works that, you know, argue for and against such an implication. Um, there have been, you know, previous black box separations that show that such an implication cannot hold. And, more recently, uh, a beautiful work by Hubachek, Naur, and Yogev, they showed that in fact this assumption is true, assuming some really strong uh, de-randomization assumptions. I'm not going to get into it, but assuming this kind of de-randomization assumption, you can prove that such an implication holds. Now, the second subclass that uh, I talked to you about was the one that was equivalent to one-way function. So here, this, of course, you know, this subclass is motivated from uh, cryptography. Um, and in this subclass, we are talking about, it's not, I mean, we are talking about not only to sample hard instances, but you need to be able to sample hard instances with their witness. Okay, so this is the second uh, kind of uh, subclass that we're going to talk about inside promise true NP search. Now, one way functions, of course, you know, from cryptography, you know, there are various assumptions based on which we can construct them, factoring, discrete log, learning with noise, etc. And one way functions is one of the most basic primitives of cryptography. It's equivalent to many of these things and most cryptographic primitives imply the existence of uh, one way functions. Now let's talk about a second related open problem. Can I show that, you know, average case hardness of NP implies existence of one way functions, okay? And here too, we have you know, evidence for and against. There are black box separations that rule out such an implication. And there is evidence to prove these things, again, assuming certain assumptions. Uh, Ostrowski and Vigderson showed, if I assume zero knowledge for uh, NP, I can show such an implication. Or 
you know, uh, assuming indistinguishability uh, of physication. So these are two related open problems to the motivating question. Was there a question? Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to very briefly ask what are black box separations? So uh, a black box separation, it restricts the kind of constructions that we talk about. So there are various notions of uh, black box uh, separation. It is about like, you know, when you construct a primitive Q from a primitive P, like the black box separations that we are talking about is that when I construct Q from P, my construction should use P only via Oracle access. It should not okay. use the internals of the thing as well as the reduction can be black box. So there are various grades of black box, but what these give, what these say is that certain kind of constructions like implications will not, you know, cannot exist. That's what this is. It doesn't completely rule out such an implication. It just says that certain kind of things cannot uh, happen. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. So um, I want to say that both these uh, um, problems are related to our motivating question. You know, TFNP and one-way functions are subclasses of promise true NP search. If I can show either of these implications are true, in fact, my motivating question that is already it, it will hold. Right, because these are subclasses, and I'm showing actually something stronger if I show one of these implications. Hold. And in fact, this talk is about these two questions, and you know we try to argue that you know these implications hold. In fact, we don't succeed in showing these implications hold separately, but we show them together, meaning that either one of these two implications must hold. Okay, we don't know which one but we know one of these two implications must hold, okay? And this implies that, this implies our motivating question that if NP is hard on the average, then promise true NP search is also hard on the average, okay? So this is going to be our outline. I'm gonna show that, you know, you know, either one holds or two holds. And the way we're going to prove, like, I mean, this is a complexity statement that we are going to do, but we are going to introduce something called interactive puzzles, which, of course, you will see will be motivated by interactive proofs uh, from cryptography. Okay, so first I'm going to recast our you know, notions of average case hardness of NP, TFNP, existence of one-way functions as a game between a challenger and attacker, again, uh, motivated by the works of Gorbich and Impaglia. So, and you will see they will, uh, casting it as a challenger attacker game, uh, will also lend itself to our notion of an interactive puzzle. Okay, so how do I capture average case hardness of NP? I think of it as a game between a challenger and attacker, both probabilistic polynomial time machine. The challenger, you know, from a distribution D samples an instance X and gives this to the attacker. And the attacker needs to produce a, a, a witness uh, W. And the challenger accepts if uh, the relation holds on this thing. Okay, now um, I should say here, I'm talking about the search version of uh, uh, average case hardness, not the decision version. So um, the non-triviality, if you recall for average case hardness of NP search requires that the distribution output a yes instance with you know, significant probability, say two thirds. And the hardness here is captured by saying that there exists no attacker that can make the challenger accept with probability one, with probability uh, better than one third, okay, for all n. Now, there is a, a slight, uh, I mean, kind of discrepancy when we talk about asymptotics from complexity theory and cryptography. And in, com in, in complexity, you often, look at infinitely often hardness versus in cryptography, you look for almost everywhere hardness. And this distinction is important, but I'm gonna kind of blur this distinction and I'm going to push it under the rug. But if you care about this distinction, I encourage you to read our paper because we do take care of uh, uh, what happens in either case. But the way I have formulated here is infinitely often hardness. It says that there is no attacker A that can, that can make the challenger accept with probability one thirds for all n, okay? Now, uh, how does this uh, picture change if I ask for average case hardness of TFNP? 
Well, it, it's exactly the same, except the non-triviality condition here becomes a totality condition, where, we, where I require that every instance has a witness. So for all X, there is some witness, okay? Now, one-way functions, on the other hand, um, let me tell the cryptographic view, and then I will cast it again as uh, an NP, uh, a, a distribution over an NP language. So one-way functions uh, can be defined as follows. The, there is a function f, the challenger you know, picks a random r, computes f of r and gives it to the attacker, and the attacker has to invert it, okay? And there's basically a hardness condition which says that an attacker cannot invert this function f with probability better than one thirds for all n. Um, but if you notice here, I mean, from cryptography, typically we are used to a more stronger hardness where, you know, even one thirds is bad. Like you don't want an attacker to even win with one thirds. You typically are only okay with the attacker winning with negligible probability. But we know that, you know, the notion here, what, I, what, we, have list, what we have defined here is actually a weak one-way function. And we know how to amplify weak to strong one-way functions. So we're going to you know, keep ourselves to weak one-way functions. Okay, so this is sort of a cryptography view of challenger attacker game, but now I'm going to, and again, uh, you know, the same thing here, I'm going to you know, blur the distinction between infinitely often and almost everywhere. An alternative formulation of one-way function from an NP language point of view is that there is a distribution D that produces an instance together with a witness, always. The challenger uses this distribution, produces the instance, gives it to the attacker, and the attacker needs to provide a, a witness, okay? So uh, how do I specify such a game for one-way functions? Well, the distribution need to sample with a witness, that's one. And the second is that there is no attacker that can make the challenger except with probability one-thirds uh, for all n. Okay, so now I've kind of casted all the problems, you know, average case complexity of NP search of PFNP of one way function as a challenger attacker game, a distribution D over an NP language uh, L. Okay. Um, I, you know, there is a slightly uh, related notion by Megiddo and Papa Dimitrio, which I'm not going to get into, but you can, you know, you can look into it if you want to see. Um, something related to uh, this one-way functions. But let me just point out here that uh, why does this, I mean, I said this is an alternative definition. Why does this give uh, a one-way function? Well, if there is a distribution D that can produce an instance together with a witness, then the one-way function is specified actually by this uh, distribution D that on input R just so consider another algorithm A or a function F that an input R runs D and only outputs X, okay? This function will be a one-way function if this is hard according to this definition because if an attacker can invert this function, it can produce this randomness R and I can recompute using this distribution and get the witness. So if I have an NP language with a distribution this way and this hardness condition, then it implies one way functions. Okay, so that's why it's an alternative uh, formulation. And you can do this both ways. Um, okay. So let's uh, just, uh, you know, uh, go back to the main theorem just for a minute. We wanted to, the main theorem we establish in this work is that if NP is hard on the average, then it implies promise true NP search is hard on the average. And the way we prove this is by showing that if NP is hard on the average, then either TFNP is hard on the average or one-way functions exist, okay? One of these two implications must, uh, must hold true. And I sort of want to point out that you know, either of these implications, we saw evidence for and against, but on its own, they are very interesting questions like that we want to understand. Um, another formulation for people who know Impagliazzo's worlds of uh, complexity, what this theorem says is that in Pessiland, which is one of the uh, worlds that Impagliazzo defines where NP is assumed to be hard on the average, but one-way functions don't exist. 
Okay, so if NP is hard in the average and one-way functions don't exist, then it implies TFNP is hard on the average. So what our theorem essentially is saying is that TFNP is hard on the average unconditionally in Pesila. Okay, so now I, you know, the rest of the talk, I sort of want to give uh, like sort of a proof overview of how we establish this, uh, this theorem. So, we're going to start by introducing a notion of interactive puzzles. And, you know, uh, we call it a puzzle, you know, it's between a challenger and attacker, but, you know, for, I don't know uh, which generation I am, but, you know, I grew up playing Super Mario. So that's like a, a example of an interactive puzzle for me. So we introduce interactive puzzles and then here, this is our outline. So first, what we're going to show is that we're going to characterize you know, the average case hardness of NP and TFNP in the eyes or in the view of a puzzle. We will show that two round puzzles, existence of two round puzzles is, you know, is equivalent to average case hardness of NP search. And if additionally, my two round puzzle has perfect completeness, then I'll show, this will imply that TFNP is hard on the average. And the main, the technical core uh, of our uh, uh, of our paper is a round collapse theorem for interactive puzzles. So if I have a k round puzzle, I can collapse it to a k minus one round puzzle if one way functions don't exist. Okay, so I'll go through each of these uh, uh, each of these uh, implications and the main lemma. Um, the main lemma is you know, if one-way functions don't exist, k-round puzzles imply k minus one-round puzzles. And this, like, if the k-round puzzle is perfectly complete, the k minus one-round puzzle is, will also be perfectly complete. And finally, we're going to again use, you know, some, uh, a technique that was used in, uh, in, for the case of interactive proofs, we can show that, look, if you start with a puzzle that is not perfectly complete, you can make it perfectly complete by adding a round, okay? And then we'll show how to, you know, combine all these ingredients to get uh, our, uh, our main theorem, okay? But I'm gonna go over this uh, one by one. So what's an interactive puzzle? Well, an interactive puzzle is going to be a game between a probabilistic polynomial time challenger and a probabilistic polynomial time attacker. And it's going to proceed in several rounds, okay? Now, by a round, I mean, you know, one back and forth. Okay, so this is a K round, uh, a K round puzzle. Now at the end, so in this puzzle, in every round, the challenger just produces a random string. Okay, for those of you who know, this is, uh, you know, interactive proofs, this is a public coin protocol because the challenger only produces random coins. And at the end of the protocol, the challenger accepts or rejects based on a deterministic polynomial time function applied on the transcript. Okay. Now, and uh, such an interactive protocol is an interactive puzzle if two conditions hold. So first is non-triviality. It says that that is a way for an attacker to win. You know, if I consider an unbounded attacker, this unbounded attacker can make the challenger accept with probability two thirds for all n. However, if I restrict the attacker to be probabilistic polynomial time, it can, um, make the challenger accept only with probability one thirds for all it, at most one thirds for all it, okay? And you can kind of see the analog. I mean, you know, if you recall how we defined NP and TFNP average case hardness, there was first a non-triviality condition of, uh, you know, that being a witness. And the second is that an attacker not being able to find a witness. Here, we just talk about making the challenger accept. Okay, so there is an unbounded uh, attacker that can win with two thirds, but uh, a probabilistic polynomial time attacker cannot succeed with probability better than one third. Okay, and as I mentioned, this is, you can see that it's such an interactive protocol where the challenger only supplies randomness is similar to something called public coin interactive proofs or Arthur Merlin games introduced by Babai and Moran in, in, in 88. However, the difference of course here is that we're talking about computational soundness as opposed to information theoretic soundness in the case of interactive proofs. 
Okay, because the soundness here only holds against probabilistic polynomial time attackers. Okay, and these two thirds and one thirds are arbitrary constants. You just need a gap. You need this to be higher than this, and you know there should be a gap. You can always use like you know standard techniques of parallel repetition, and you can make this the best possible numbers, meaning that. An unbounded attacker can win with one minus negligible probability, and no probabilistic polynomial time attacker can win better than a negligible probability. And what's a perfectly complete puzzle? Well, the non-triviality becomes, you know, not probability two thirds, but with probability one. Okay. And again, this is you can see like this is the distinction between NP and TFNP. Here we are talking about just puzzle and perfectly complete puzzle. Okay, so the first theorem recall what we were talking about. I'm going to characterize average case hardness of NP search through puzzles. I'm going to show that average case NP search is equivalent to two round puzzles. Okay, and I, I apologize for calling it a two round puzzle. I said back and forth is one round. But you know, just bear with me. It's just one back and forth. I'm going to show that this is equivalent to NP search, and I should change my slides uh, accordingly. Okay, so here is a two-round puzzle. Um, the challenger sends, um, you know, a random string, and the attacker produces P, and the, a, the challenger accepts, you know, if there is some, you know, public predicate V based on which on the transcript returns one. Okay, now you can see that. The structure already implies, like an existence of a two round puzzle implies NP is hard on the average. Okay. And this is because you can, you know, R1 can, can you know, can, uh, will be the, can specify the instance and P1 can be the witness. Okay. Now you can see that the non triviality condition uh, implies that. For at least two thirds of these instances, there is a witness, which means my distribution produces uh, yes instances with decent probability, and no attacker can find a witness with probability better than, better than one third. So this directly implies that NP is hard on the average. On the other hand, I want to show that if NP is hard on the average, then it implies a two round puzzle. I cannot quite prove that because when you talk about average case hardness of NP, it is with respect to an arbitrary distribution. Okay, so uh, when you say NP is hard on the average, it means there's a language L and some distribution D on which it is hard. Now, I cannot say that that directly implies a puzzle because my first round actually needs to be a random string. And the way average case hardness of NP is like, I, I take a distribution and according to that, I sample an instance. And that might not be the uniform distances, uh, uniform, it might not be the uniform distribution, right? So, but however, this observation still holds that if NP is hard on the average with respect to the uniform distribution, then it implies a two-round puzzle, right? If I consider only uniform distributions, then it implies a two-round puzzle, okay? But this, with respect to uniform distribution, seems like a restriction of average case hardness, but it isn't. In fact, Impaglia 11 showed that if NP is hard on the average, like with respect to arbitrary, you know, polynomial time sampleable distribution, it is also hard on the average with respect to the uniform distribution. Okay, so the other way is also true because if NP is hard on the average, it's hard on the average with respect to the uniform distribution, and that implies a two round puzzle. Okay, so two round puzzles are equivalent to average case hardness of NP search. Yes. Uh, just a quick question. I'm not familiar with the concept of a, in average k in yeah the, the average hardness that you just mentioned. That is it. Does it mean that um, a, that every language in NP has to be hard in the average, or that there exists at least one? That exists at least one. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So um, that's the first claim, and now you can also see that. I mean, the other thing which I said, if I have a two round puzzle with perfect completeness, then it implies TFNP is hard on the average. Because if I have a puzzle with perfect completeness, meaning every R1 has a P1 such that V of R1 P1 equals one, then if I, you know, the way I define my NP instance from the puzzle, I'll have that every instance has a witness. 
Okay. So if my puzzle is perfectly complete, recall that the first condition here is with probability one, which means that the corresponding NP language defined by this puzzle is such that every instance will have a witness. Okay, so if my puzzle is perfectly complete, then the implication is that TFNP is hard on the average. Okay, so these were the first basic just observations that follow from just our definition of puzzle and you know how we can characterize average case complexity of NP and TFNP. Now, going to the core technical thing in our uh, in our work is we want to understand the complexity of a K round puzzle, not a two round, but a K round puzzle. Okay, specifically, we'd like to know if a K round puzzle implies, you know, is it equivalent to uh, uh, average case hardness of NP? We know two rounders, but what, what about more rounds? Is it, uh, you know, does it become any easier? Okay, and uh, we've known like, you know, uh, round collapse theorems for public coin proof systems. This is due to Baba and Moron. Um, and one would think that maybe we could apply one of these to uh, our puzzles to get such uh, an implication. And, uh, and I just want to say specifically, Baba and Moron showed that if I have a public coin interactive proof, I can collapse the rounds, okay? Now I'm going to show in, a, in, a, in either the next or a couple of slides down, I'm going to show that in fact, this Babai Moran's round collapse does not work for puzzles, specifically because our soundness condition is computational. Okay. So, still, we want to know whether this holds. And what we actually show is that there is a round collapse theorem that we can prove. And for example, if you apply that round collapse to a constant round, you can apply this round collapse only a constant number of times. A constant round puzzle, you can reduce it to a two round puzzle, which we know is equivalent to NP is hard on the average. So constant round puzzles imply average case hardness of NP. But what about more? We actually show that end round puzzles is equivalent to P space not in BPP. Now, what this kind of says is that, you know, P space not in BPP is kind of really like a, a more benign assumption than NP not equal to P, right? We're asking if P space can be solved in BPP. And we believe that a round collapse from end round to constant round, like this is unlikely, because then we'll kind of show that P space not in BPP implies NP is hard on the average, which would be phenomenal if we could do that. Okay. So what's the main theorem we show? We show that if one-way functions don't exist, then a K-round puzzle can be you know, collapsed by one round, okay? So from a K-round, I can go to a K minus one round. Now, by applying this lemma repeatedly, ah, okay, good. So let me just tell you how I get theorem one from the main lemma, okay? So the main lemma says if one-way functions don't exist, then a K-round puzzle is can be reduced to a K minus one round puzzle. Now, the theorem one is proved as follows. If a constant round puzzle exists, then we have two choices. Either one-way functions exist or one-way functions don't exist. If one-way functions don't exist, then I can apply this lemma, take a constant round puzzle and make it a two round puzzle. Great. But if one-way functions exist, then I can't apply this, but I really don't have to apply it because existence of a one-way function implies a two round puzzle already. So in either worlds, I can show that that exists a two round puzzle. So constant round puzzles um, can be collapsed to a two round puzzles either way by applying this main lemma, okay? So proof of theorem one, if one way functions don't exist, apply the lemma. If one way functions exist, then you already have a two round puzzle. Okay, so now I want to talk about this Baba Moran transformation of round collapse and kind of argue why this doesn't work for uh, an interactive uh, interactive puzzle as we have defined it, okay? So first, let me give you the Baba Moran transformation and like even give you a very short proof of how it works, okay? So what Baba, I'm gonna apply it just for, you know, I'm gonna collapse it, you know, a three move protocol to a two move protocol, okay? So the basic idea is to, repeat the second and third rounds you know, many, many times and then reverse the order of messages. So the challenger gives 
R1 through Rm. Instead of a single challenge, it's giving R1 through Rm. And the attacker needs to produce a single first message and several second messages corresponding to each of these challenges. And the challenger accepts if each of these M instances corresponding to the three round protocol is accepted, okay? So meaning that P1, R1, P2, 1, P1, R2, P2, 2, P1, Rm, P2, M are each accepted, okay? There's a typo here, this should be P2, 2, but the attacker wins if it can produce a single P1 and, you know, uh, and a P2 for each Ri such that P1, Ri, P2, I is accepting for the uh, original protocol, okay? So the hard part here for the attacker is that, you know, it gets to see the challenge before, but it needs to produce a single first message that's good for all the second messages. That's why uh, you're gonna see how that's how this will, uh, you can show that this will, if this is hard, then this will also be hard, okay? So here is a quick proof of how that works. So to, to make this proof work, we need to repeat it sufficiently. How many times? Well, this M that we repeat needs to be significantly bigger than the length of P1. And why length? Because we're going to apply some kind of a union bound. But this M needs to be bigger than the length of the first message. Okay, so we know that this first game is hard, right? This three move uh, game is hard. What does that mean? It means that there is no attacker that can win this with probability better than one third, which means for any first message that the attacker gives, there is at least two thirds of R that cannot that, you know, there is at least two thirds of R for which the attacker cannot win. Or in other words, there is at most one third fraction of R's that for which the attacker can provide a second message. Okay, and recall that the Baba Moran transformation, this is for unconditional soundness, meaning the attacker is unbounded. Okay, so it means, so we can essentially, you know, say that for every P1, there is at most one third fraction of R's for which there is a P2 on which C accepts, okay? So now let's look at this game. How should this attacker win? Well, the attacker needs to produce a single P1 and all these need to be accepted. But first let's ask about, well, it, will, uh, it can produce all these blue messages only if each of these Ri's are all good for P1, right? Recall, that's how we define good. A good R is one on which the attacker can, pr can produce a blue message. And now if an attacker needs to win in this collapsed protocol, it needs to find uh, all these, uh, it needs to find a P1 for which all of these are good, okay? But now let's just ask for any P1, how many tuples of R1 through Rm are good? And this is a simple counting argument. Well, if each P1 has only one third fraction good and M tuple of Ri are all good, with at most fraction one over three to the M, right? So consider all M tuple of uh, messages, at most one over three to the M of fraction of these are going to be good for any specific P1, okay? And now we're just going to eliminate by using a, uh, by using a union bound. Well, for each P1, there is like one over three to the M good tuples. Now let's look at how many like tuples are even good for any P1. Okay, so then I just, you know, sum it over for, there are two to the size of P1, number of P1 messages, and each of them, there is like one over three to the M fraction. So at most this much fraction of tuples have some P1 for which it is good. But just because I set M large enough, this is negligible. So only a negligible fraction of these tuples ever have a P1 for which they are good. So this means that this will also be hard. There is only a negligible probability with which the attacker can fit in this collapsed protocol. And this is how the Babai Moran transformation works. And now I'm going to tell you how, um, I'm going to tell you uh, why this transformation doesn't work for a puzzle. Okay, I'm going to give you a counter example. So here, um, Consider this, uh, consider this uh, interactive, uh, consider this puzzle, okay? So in this puzzle, 
the attacker in the first round needs to produce a P1, which is hashed of some database of bits, okay? And um, the challenger is going to produce, after the, the attacker produces a hash of a database and you know assume this hash is collision resistant. Now the challenger is going to produce an index I and a bit P and will accept the blue message if the attacker is able to produce a database whose ith bit is B and agrees with the hash function, okay? So the hash of the database must be what it produced in the first message and the ith message, ith bit of this database needs to bit B. So for example, if the challenger gives I equals pi and B equals one, then the fifth bit of the database needs to be one. But now, as you can see, since the hash function is collision resistant, the attacker needs to commit to the database before it sees the challenge. And you know it cannot produce a different database than the one it committed in the first round. So the probability that this attacker can win this game is a half because this bit B was randomly chosen. And you know since the attacker fixed the database in the first round, it cannot win this with probability better than a half. Okay, so this game is hard. But now let's look at the collapsed protocol. In the collapsed protocol, the attacker is actually going to see all the challenges. It's going to see I1, B1, I2, B2, I, M, B, M. And then it needs to produce a hash of a database and this. But since I saw all the challenges, now I can fix the database that will agree with all this randomness. Okay, with all these requests, all these challenges, I1, B1, I will put uh, B1 in the I1th position, B2 in the I2th position, so forth, and produce a database and I can succeed. So this is completely broken. This two-round protocol, this attacker can win. The only small thing you need to make sure is that the probability that you know, I choose the same index on two of these challenges is not too high, okay? The index doesn't repeat because if the index repeats, then in one index, I might say zero. And then again, I'll say one and, you know, the attacker can never win in such a game. But if I have, uh, I, you know, the database long enough, we can show that this won't happen. So we can create an instance for the Babai moron transformation where, you know, when I think of a puzzle, this round collapse does not work. And I should point out that, you know, the Babai Moran transformation is for unconditional protocol, not for computationally sound. And here, the soundness holds only for a, a probabilistic polynomial time attacker because an unbounded attacker can break the hash function. So we are relying on the collision resistance of hash functions to argue that the three round, uh, the three message protocol is hard. Okay. So the the uh, uh, the import of the slide is that the Babai Moran transformation does not work when you consider computational sounds. And here is the counter example. Okay, so now I spent an enormous effort showing why the Babai Moran transformation does not work. But now I'm going to come back and say that, well, you know, it does work. Okay, but with a caveat. I'm going to say that the Babai Moran transformation works for puzzles if one way functions don't exist. Okay, so that's the, the, main, uh, the, the main catch over here. So now you can ask, well, I just gave a counter example and how are you going to say this lemma works? Well, it's this thing that one way functions don't exist. If one way functions don't exist, collision resistant hash functions don't exist, which means my counter example doesn't exist anymore. So if one way functions don't exist, I'll show that this round collapse works. Okay, so. If why counter example work, uh, fails is if because you know you don't have collision resistant hash functions. Okay, so now um, I have, do I have at least 10 minutes? Ah, I don't have 10 minutes. Yeah, you have, you have 10 I minutes. I have 10 minutes? Okay, good. So uh, let me try to, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the proof as to how this, this works. Um, I'm going to, uh, these are two proof ingredients. One is that, look, uh, what, how do you use an assumption one-way functions don't exist? Well, if one-way functions don't exist, then you can invert any polynomial time function, okay? And in fact, you can do better than that. You, in fact, in Paglitz and Levin sh showed that, well, if one-way functions don't exist, you can do better than inverting any polynomial time function. In fact, you can invert it like with the right distribution, right? So, you know, a one-way function, like, you know, that can be many pre-images. And what Impaglio 11 says is that, look, if one-way functions don't exist, there is a mechanism to invert 
where I uniformly sample among these three images. Okay, it's a stronger theorem that you can show if one-way functions don't exist. And then another uh, ingredient we're going to use is like some parallel repetition ideas, you know, uh, based on Raz's sampling lemma. So I'm not going to do, go into this because I don't think I'll cover, I'll be able to cover this in, in 10 minutes. What I want to do is I want to talk about this security reduction. I want to prove why the round collapse works if one-way functions don't exist. Okay, so it's the same construction. I have, you know, P1, R, P2. I'm going to repeat R several times, make the challenger produce it first, and then have the attacker give a single P1 and several P2 messages. Okay, and I want to show that if the original three message protocol is uh, a puzzle, then the collapsed two round uh, after the Babai Moran transformation is also a puzzle. Okay, this is what I want to show. And the way you have to show it, you cannot show it unconditionally, it's computational, which means I need to provide a security reduction. Meaning that if there is an attacker that breaks the two move, two message proto, two message, the, the collapsed puzzle, then there is an attacker that can break the original puzzle, the three message puzzle, okay? So let, let's say that, uh, and this security reduction, so let's say that I assume for contradiction, that there is an attacker A prime that breaks the two message puzzle, okay? And S here signifies its random tip and you'll see why I'll need it. So let's say that there is this attacker A prime that can you know, break my two message puzzle. I'm gonna construct an attacker A that breaks the three message puzzle with the challenger C, okay? So what is this attacker going to do? Well, the first attacker needs to produce a message P1 to C, right? Remember the three message protocol is P1, R, P2. Now this attacker is going to use internally A prime to produce P1. It's just going to run, you know, it's internally going to pick random R1 through Rm and run this attacker A prime and see what it's going to respond. Well, you know, it responds with a single P1 and several P2. And this attacker is like, look, I'm going to take this red message and forward it outside, okay? Now the challenger outside is going to produce a randomness R. And this attacker needs to produce a blue message P2 that makes this challenger accept, okay? Now, if we are lucky, this R that the challenger gives is exactly one of the Rs that I internally picked, okay? And then if it is, then I can just use this blue message and forward it here. Let's say if R equals R2, then I can just forward P2 2 and send it to C, okay? But the chances of that is unlikely. I mean, these random messages are long. The probability that R equals one of my Ri's is going to be like really negligible. So this doesn't work, okay? So the goal is, well, I've given P1. I already committed to P1, I got R, but now I somehow need A prime to produce a blue message corresponding to R that I want to forward outside. Now I'm kind of stuck, okay? So now here is where I'm going to use the fact that I know I can invert one-way functions. Okay, so I'm going to strategically define a one-way function that will provide a random tape for this attacker and provide these first messages for this attacker such that R is implanted over here and this attacker exactly gives the same P1 I gave, okay? Because if I'm able to provide, produce such, you know, a, a tuple of messages and a random tape, I can run the attacker and see what blue message it gives corresponding to the implanted R, okay? So if I'm able to discover or identify such a situation, I can win this game outside. And I'm going to do that by defining a one-way function. And here is my one-way function. This one-way function takes this input S, which is you know, the random tape, uh, which is going to be mapped to the random tape of this attacker A prime, a tuple of messages R, R1 through Rm, and an index I. The function is going to run, um, actually this should be A prime, I apologize. So this function is going to run A prime with random tape S and first message R1 through Rm, and see what this attacker responds. It could either respond nothing or it can respond P a red and you know a, a convincing second message. And I am going to output the first message, which is P1, and I'm going to output Ri, 
the ayat uh, uh, message of this tuple. Okay? This seems like a strange function, but you're going to see that this is exactly the function that I will need to succeed over here because it's producing P1 from the internal interaction on tuple R and randomness S, and it is producing the challenge Ri that uh, I will need to care about. So if I define a, this is a one-way function because my A prime is probabilistic, like it's a, it's a PP, it's a, uh, it's a PPT machine, but when I fix the random date, it becomes polynomial time. So this function is polynomial time. Now, I want to find, I want to send a P2. The way I'm going to do it is I am going to take P1 and this uh, R, and I'm going to ask F to invert it on that message. So I'm going to say invert F on P1 and R to get a random tape T, a tuple of messages Z and an index I. Now, this means that I have, if I'm able to invert this function, it means that there is a random tape and a tuple of messages and an index I such that this attacker produces a successful second message where the first P1 is this P1 because that's the that's output and the randomness is R, the R that I care about. So, and I know that this R is implanted in the index I because that's what I output. So, I will rerun the attacker A prime on the tuple Z with random tape T, and I will pick the blue message corresponding to index I. And then I can just forward this to P2, okay? So this is essentially the security reduction. This is where I use the fact that I can invert one-way functions, okay? Now, the missing part of this ingredient is that you know that one-way functions are invertible, but you need to invert it on the right distribution, right? So uh, one-way function says, I pick a random x, f of x equals y, invert it on y, I can do it. But here, I don't know if I'm sampling like the, the image on the right distribution. Here is where we are going to use something called the Rasis lemma to, to say that the distribution we pick here is close to being uh, right. And I, that's the part I'm skipping right now. And you know I'll uh, you know, look at the paper on how we deal with it. But that's how we deal with not being the right distribution. And this is how the reduction works, okay? So now what I want to do is uh, I want to conclude uh, the proof. I, I've given you all the various ingredients and I want to show you how we put it together to get the main theorem. And this shouldn't take more than two, three minutes, okay? So what all we did do we show? Well, we showed that the main lemma, which is that if one-way functions don't exist, I can collapse by one round. Well, I showed three to two, but you can extend it to k to k minus one. And one more thing I didn't point out is that if my K round was perfectly complete, the collapsed protocol will also be perfectly complete. This follows just from the Babai Moran transformation. And we also showed that, you know, harden the average uh, uh, NP search is equivalent to two round puzzle. Two round puzzle with perfect completeness implies TFNP is harden the average. The last claim, which again, I won't have time to show you is that I can transform a two round puzzle to a three round puzzle with perfect completeness. Okay, this is again inspired by work in interactive proofs. We show how to do this. Okay, so now I'm going to combine all these things to prove our main theorem. And recall our main theorem says, if NP is hard on the average, then either TFNP is hard on the average or one way functions exist, right? This is what I want to prove. Okay, so here is how we combine it. Now, if NP is hard on the average, then I know it is equivalent to two round puzzle. So there exists a two round puzzle. Now, if there exists a two round puzzle, there exists a three round puzzle with perfect completeness. This is the last transformation that I mentioned. So now I have a three round puzzle with perfect completeness. Now I'm going to collapse this using my main theorem. That is, I'm going to say, if one way functions don't exist, then I can collapse this to a two round puzzle with perfect completeness. And recall that a two round puzzle with perfect completeness implies TFNP is harder than the average. So what I have shown here is that if one way functions don't exist, NP is harder than the average implies TFNP is harder than the average. And this proves our main theorem because if NP is harder than the average, one of two things happen. Either one way functions exist or one way functions don't exist. So if one way functions exist, then I've proved that implication. NP is harder than the average implies one way functions. But if one-way functions don't exist, then 
NP is hard on the average implies TFNP is hard on the average using this uh, sequence of uh, uh, theorems. Okay, so that's it. So if NP is hard on the average, then either one-way functions exist or TFNP is hard on the average. At least one of these two must hold. To conclude, the well, I mean, what we proved is actually something in complexity about average case hardness of uh, of NP, the techniques that we have used are like inspired by interactive proofs and arguments from cryptography. We, we introduced this notion of interactive puzzle. We captured average case complexity in the, um, uh, you know, uh, through interactive puzzles. And then we applied like these things that we've learned for proofs and arguments and applied it to puzzles. Okay, we proved around the, the main, you know, the key technical ingredient is this round collapse theorem for uh, puzzles. Now, there are a couple of other implications we show, you know, for like public coin arguments, we can show some hard on the average. Uh, we can show that NP slash poly is hard on the average. And there have been some follow up work that uh, uh, has shown some implications for uh, you know, other things. But um, with that, I will. Um, I'll conclude my talk. Thanks. Um, thank you, Muru. Uh, let's see maybe if uh, anyone has any questions. Uh, uh, very nice work. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Can I ask if, like, uh, in the main theorem, the, there's a cool technique using uh, the assumption, assuming uh, one-way function does not exist, right? Yeah. Uh, do you know uh, like uh, this technique uh, or similar assumption, assuming one-way function exists, it not exist? Uh, yes. Previous? Yes, it has been done before. So uh, the work of Ostrowski and Vigderson actually do that. So they have used this idea of like, you know, considering this dichotomy, either one way functions exist, or if it doesn't, then I can invert. So it has been uh, done before. Muthu, uh, I also would like to ask you something. Yeah. Uh, can you go back in the slides? I'm sorry, I'm gonna make you go backwards. Like a lot. It's, when, you, when, when you describe, um, when you put like at the top, you put uh, uh, this is our main theorem. Yeah, yeah, there, twenty-two. Yeah, so 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 this is your main theorem, and you mentioned the way you prove it is by proving this this junction, like the, this implies yeah. this. Is, uh, uh, can you maybe clarify a little bit how is that this is junction implies uh, the promise through and search? Good, good, good. So uh, look, I wanted to show that n like average case hardness of NP implies average case hardness of promise through NP search, and uh, just. What does it mean to say something is average case hard? I need to produce a language L and a distribution D on which this is tr on this on which it's hard, right? So, what this theorem says is that each of these, the each of these like one-way functions and TF TFNP, they are subclasses of promise true NP search. That's how that's what I started. I said, look, promise true NP search says that the distribution D must always produce a yes instance. Right? I mean, this is the, uh, the subclass I'm, I'm thinking about. And both of these give me such distributions. So TFNP, no matter what distribution you pick, it will always pick a yes instance because every instance is a yes instance. So it is a promise true. It is an instance of a promise true NP search. Similarly, one-way functions also define a distribution where every instance output by the distribution will be a yes instance because it outputs an instance together with a witness. So in either of these cases, I get an instance of a promise true NP search, a language L and a distribution D that always outputs a yes instance. So either of these implications, like, in, like if I proved either of these implications, it means that there is a language L and a distribution D in the promise true NP search. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it actually does. Maybe maybe you mentioned it and it missed it. I'm, I'm sorry. But yeah, oh, no, 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 that's actually, okay. Yeah, it does make sense. Thank you. Okay, 
So um, looks like we do not have any more questions. Uh, in that case, Mutu, thank you very much for your talk. It was really great. Um, very uh, interesting insight. I think it was very helpful. So thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everyone.